Okay, it works. Thank you. Hi, yes. There might not be a lot of time for questions. However, uh, I'm around all day, and if you want to ask questions, really don't hesitate. Even if I'm a, with a very small human, uh, she will be around. Just come and ask questions. Uh, she's not great at Postgres, so I will be answering them. Uh, so today we're going to talk about Postgres statistics. Uh, and oh, sorry. Oh, yes, closer. No, okay. Sorry. Yes, I am shorter than the person before. Um, so a little bit about me, uh, I'm Louise, I'm a principal software engineer at Crunchy Data, where I worked on Crunchy Bridge, which is a managed Postgres service. Um, I, I love my job, uh, it's really a lot of fun, and I've been working with Ruby, Crystal, of course, SQL. Uh, before that, I was mainly doing Python, but I'm the kind of person that doesn't have a lot of uh, strong opinions, and so I went from Python to Ruby being like, Meh, okay, and also went to Emacs from Emacs to Vim being like, eh, okay, uh, because my husband has a great Vim configuration, so I was like, mm, yeah, I'll steal your configuration and stop using Emacs, so I'm not going to be there when people fight about those things. Uh, however, Postgres is the best database, of course. Uh, you have my blog. Uh, I haven't posted new articles since 2019, but you know, while preparing this talk, uh, I, you know, figured I should write about uh, statistics. Um, I used to love climbing on a more personal level, uh, but I, I kind of stopped recently because I don't have time and I, I loved sleeping. I was the kind of person who sleeps nine hours a day, but now I get a good four. So, uh, is this the default picture of Keynote for the slides? Yes, I figured I'm here. You see who I am. You don't need a picture here. So what are we going to talk about today? Uh, we're going to talk about Postgres statistics. Uh, so the first thing we'll cover is how you can, as a user, look at the statistics that are gathered by Postgres on your tables. Uh, and then we'll talk about specifically which statistics are gathered by default. And to understand why Postgres gathers them, we'll talk about the query optimizer and how it's using, using it to uh, gather costs. Uh, and then we'll go into why that's not enough, like why sometimes you get wrong query plans because of statistics. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about extended statistics configuration. And then we'll talk in the, so the two parts that will be more focused on Postgres source code. So the more internal parts are how the query optimizer uses them and how statistics are, oh no, oh, oh yeah, okay. Uh, how statistics are gathered. So we'll go into the algorithms of how Postgres gathers the statistics, which is kind of linked uh, with some limitations that you can have with statistics. So for this talk, uh, I use a sample database that you can download. Uh, and so if you are ever looking for a sample database, it's a good one. It's a small, like 12 gigabyte database. So it's not really big, so it's very easy to get on your own laptop. Um, and that's a database that is uh, clinical studies, like medical studies uh, that are uh, gathered on, the, uh, on clinicaltrials.gov. That's a US government website. Um, and it, it's about all the you know, current and past clinical studies. Uh, the data is gathered by investigators uh, with clinical research, their outcome, the adverse events, so all the side effects. It's a very interesting database that gave me nightmares. <laughs> because, and I, I, I was kind of careful when doing those slides because we all have our own history. There's a lot about cancer. There's a lot of, uh, about diseases that affect children. That's horrible, but it's an amazing database if you're interested in human bodies. Um, so looking at your statistics. Um, by the way, I will be sharing the slides. And that's important because later on, there's very complicated math that you'll have to trust that I did right. But if you want to double check on your own time for fun, I will share the slides. So you have this PG stats view. Um, that shows a user-friendly version of the PG statistics table because the PG statistics table for uh, optimization of disk space is very hard for user to look at. Uh, so you have uh, your schema name, table name, attribute name, and then all of the things that are gathered by Postgres will show, you know, in a minute which each of these things means. 
So don't worry. So here's an example of what you would see. You would see for this uh, outcome analysis, you have the CI percent, which is confidence interval for those who haven't done a lot of clinical studies. Um, and so you will have the most common values, most common frequency, histogram, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's a pretty nice way to look at your statistics. So let's talk about the statistic gathered by default, by Postgres. So that happens when you do an analyze or when auto vacuum happens for you. So uh, most common values and histograms will dig, like we'll dive a little deeper into them in a minute. So uh, first, dissing values, it's an estimation of the number of values that you would have in that table for this column. Uh, the average datum width, well, that's pretty, that's in the name, it's the average datum width. And it's calculated for, uh, for types where it varies, like JSON, like texts, while for a like integer, it's going to be just the constant of the size of that type. The fraction of null values, so the percentage of rows that are null uh, for that column, and the correlation. So the correlation varies from minus one to one, and it uh, shows uh, whether there, like, it's a float of, to indicate if there is a link between where the data is physically in your database and the value of that column. An example would be uh, for if you have a big int as your ID and you have a sequence, you would expect that to be closer to one than if your ID is a UID, because you know your rows are going to be one, two, three, four, five, and where they are going to be in the database should match that roughly. It's not a perfect one or zero because when you update a row, you know you might have one, two, three, four physically in your database. If you update row two, it's going to delete it and reinsert it after, so you will have one, three, four, two. And so that's why the correlation isn't a one or zero, it's a float. So the most common values are gathered along with their distribution. So again, kind of the percentage of rows that have that value. So here I'm looking at the conditions uh, that uh, patients have for those clinical studies. And I see that in my most common values, it starts with healthy, which I think is interesting in, you know, clinical studies. Uh, and you'll see that 1.1% of the rows have this healthy value. Second one being breast cancer, which is a lot more depressing. Um, so uh, this, the number of values that are gathered by Postgres depends on uh, some configurations that we'll dig into just in a minute. But you should know that if you have a type where uh, in your data set, there's only a, like, three values like this one, and enum being a very good example of that, all of the values will be in your most common values and that will be a really short list. Um, if you're wondering how accurate uh, those, uh, those frequencies are, are here compared to, uh, you know, the most common values, here's, you know, is it accurate? So I'm looking at the conditions where the name is healthy, and it's estimating here uh, that there will be 10,283 rows that uh, match the name healthy, and, you know, the actual rows is 10,040, which, you know, close enough. So now let's talk about histogram. So um, histogram describe the data distribution outside of the most common values. So look, we know the, sorry, we know the selectivity of uh, the, the frequency, sorry, of the most common values. So now what we want is to have an idea of how the rest of the data is distributed. So what Postgres is going to do is create dis evenly distributed buckets. Um, and Little note, uh, if you have an enum like earlier, so you only have a few values in the most common values, then you're not going to have an, a histogram. So histograms are not always computed. Uh, but here's an example of a histogram here for the column count and baseline counts. And the theory in Postgres is that in the bucket between 77 and 85, there would be roughly as many rows as, you know, this bucket between 568 and 600. 
So here's a fun query. I'm not going to go into that query. Again, I'm sharing the slides so that you can have fun and run queries again if you want to on your own database. You just have to change the attribute name and the table name. Uh, but I, I ran that query to be able to show this. So this is a graph of that same uh, histogram that I just showed and uh, how many actual rows are in, the, in my table per bucket. So here on my x-axis, and I know it's very small, but it's the, it's the buckets of my histogram. So it starts with 77, ends with whatever this number is. Um, and what we see is that uh, in each bucket, so from 77 to I think it's 85, there's roughly a thousand something rows. And so it varies between 420 rows, I think, 23, to roughly a thousand. And you might think, well, that's actually a pretty big difference. But if you look at the percentage of rows that it represents in that database, here's the, again, uh, another graph where instead I have the percentage of uh, total rows that it represents. And so each bucket, again, uh, is on the x-axis. On the y-axis, I have the percentage. And it varies from 0.2% of my um, table, not database, sorry, of my table uh, to 0.06%, I think. It's very small, 0.6%. Uh, so the buckets are pretty evenly distributed. The question being like, how accurate is this? So if I look at a number that is in the first bucket, so the count is 78 here, and I compare again my explain uh, in my explain analyze the estimated rows, here it's 468, and the actual rows is 504. Again, close enough. But here's a fun example. Uh, this doesn't really say anything about statistics. It's just I had fun like looking at statistics when working on this talk, and I found this one weird, weird. So here's, again, my, um, my confidence interval percent. And uh, the histogram starts with minus 42.88. And here's my question. What clinical study has not a confidence interval of 0%, like, oh, this was not a good study, let's give it a zero, but minus 42. Like, how, how do you, like, how bad, what did you do to the patients? It's, it's a, what? And so I looked into that study and I read the paper. Let me tell you, the paper name, Inefficientness Children and Adolescent, blah, 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 with familial hypercholesterolemia, uh, was, I think, probably interesting. I don't know, I didn't understand a word of it. It's just like, when it comes to medicine, I'm like, yeah, we have two arms usually. I mean, I guess the average is probably lower than two. Uh, I don't know, right amount of organs, hopefully. Uh, so I didn't really understand the paper. However, not one time was there uh, an confidence interval less than 85%, 95%. So my conclusion is, well, humans make mistakes, especially in a database where the values are filled regularly by doctor, investigators, sponsors. And so you have this very human database about human things um, where mistakes happen. And if you think, well, yeah, but my database, you know, it's the code, so my database wouldn't have this problem. You think that, you know, you will never write a bug, really, ever? Uh, so what I would say is this column shouldn't be allowed negative value. So probably you should uh, have constraints on your database level and not always trust the code or the people to, um, to do things, which is not really related to statistics, but constraints are great too. So how the query optimizer uses statistics. That's a fun part, I think. Well, you might think otherwise. So what are statistics for? Um, so when you run a query, behind the little Postgres brain is going to generate different paths to execute that query, different ways that it could compute things. And it will best pick the best one based on costs and use that query plan and then execute the query. To estimate the costs, it will use those statistics uh, and specifically, you know, the numbers of rows that this query is supposed to return, the size of the data that it's supposed to return, the number of pages that are going to be scanned. 
Uh, and to do that, we need all of those statistics we talked about. So the main one we'll focus on today is selectivity. So selectivity gives us the percentage of rows uh, return when you apply your clauses, your filters. Um, that selectivity will give us the number of rows. It will also give us the average, the, the, the size of the data because we know what columns we have with the average datum width. Uh, it will help choose a query plan because if you have a where clause that is going to, you know, be filtering most rows, so give you a very, very small data set, it's better to use an index cap. If there are indexes, I guess. Um, if a where clause is returning most rows, it makes more sense to uh, do a sequential scan because uh, the when you're reading data from a table, uh, going from one page to the other for um, for the reading head of the uh, is much faster than having to jump between the index and uh, and the row. Uh, so that's why having a good estimation of how much of the table it's going to return is important in choosing the query plan. So here's what we'll talk about today. Um, we'll talk about selectivities for where clauses where your column equals a constant or where you call them, you know, one of smaller, bigger, smaller than equal, bigger than equal, so scalar uh, operators, constant. I'm focusing on those ones because you should know that this cell function, so the selectivity function file is 8,000 lines long. And so I had to choose because selectivity is also uh, computed for estimating your joins. So what algorithm are you go going to choose for your joins? And same for your group buys. So I really had to narrow it down to what I'm going to talk about. And I think, you know, this one is a good start. And if you want to dig more, if you want to know more about selectivity, uh, you should, you can look at this self selectivity function file. It's really fun. Uh, and then we'll again uh, uh, look at how they are combined with an end. Again, you can have or um, and uh, completely just ignoring subqueries. So just just looking at end. And then we'll talk about uh, how the selectivity gives us some number of rows. And again, all of this is in the uh, file cost size if you want to dig deeper than just uh, the estimation of number of rows. So um, first for the equal clause, uh, this the var at const here is the name of the function if you want to read the function. Uh, it's just as a quick anecdote, uh, in the initial version of this talk, I was even giving the names of the variables used by Postgres. And then I figured this is going a little far. I don't think anyone wants to come like get out of this room and be like, wow, naming goes so good. Uh, so. The equal clause. Uh, what's the, the way we're going to estimate the selectivity is first look at our most common values. If the, the constant that you have the equal, like the right uh, element on the equal is in the, is in the most common values, we have the exact selectivity in our most common frequencies. So that's simple. Here's an example. Um, I'm getting all the facilities in Boston. Boston on my uh, most common values is the fourth one, and here I have the ex exact selectivity the here, and it's 0 0.008, so this will be the selectivity. That's pretty easy. Now, it's, if it's not in the most common values, here's what we're going to do. We know that, you know, the value is in the most common value, so we're going to initialize um, the selectivity to one minus the sum of all those most common frequencies. Then we're gonna we know that the it's not the constant is not null, so we're going to remove that as well. So we'll get a percentage of rows that are not the most common and that are not null. And then we're going to look at how many values I have, distinct values I have outside of the most common values. Uh, so for that, I look at the distinct, that is one of the statistics gathered by Postgres, and I remove the length of my most common values uh, array. And that will give me a number. 
and I will do a selectivity, my initial one, divided by other distincts. This assumes that outside of your most common values that have their own frequencies, all of the, your data is evenly distributed. And that is not always true. So here's an example of uh, the math that is done. Uh, again, I'll share those slides, so if you want to double check my math, you can. Uh, so I'm looking at selectivities for cities that are Grenoble, very good city in France, not in my most common values. Oh, yeah, I agree. Uh, so the null fraction here is zero. Uh, and they have, you know, 6,655 distincts. Uh, I did this query to get, uh, I have 100 most common values in my most common values array. And this is uh, their, um, the sum of all of their frequencies. So I do my initial the initialization. So one minus zero, basically, and minus like this fraction of uh, all of my uh, most common frequency, which is almost 32%. I get this value here. And then my uh, distance outside of the uh, most common values is this n distance minus 100, which was the length of my most common values. And then I get, you know, 0.01% as my selectivity for the value Cronach. So let's talk now about selectivity for um, scalar operators. So that's this little function, scalar in Excel. That's cool naming. Um, so to be able to evaluate the selectivity of a where clause, um, we have to look at more data than when it's just an equal. So we have to get the selectivity in the most common values, a selectivity of the histogram, and then we combine to get the overall selectivity for that where clause. So getting the selectivity for um, the most common values, we initialize it to zero. We loop through our most common values. We apply the operator to the current value. If it matches, we add it. We add the uh, frequency to the selectivity. Here's an example. Um, I'm doing this select star from outcome analysis where the confidence interval is bigger or equal to 95. Here are my most common values. I will loop through them. The first one matches yes, no, no, yes, et cetera, et cetera. And so I will get the frequency for each of those values that match and combine them here by adding them and we get around 62% matching this where clause. Um, now let's get the histogram selectivity. So to get the histogram selectivity, what we do is look for the buckets that match my clause. Because again, we know, in theory, I think it's like most of the time accurate, uh, that the buckets are evenly distributed. So we just want to know how many buckets match the where clause. And so we initialize a count to zero. We loop, loop through the histogram values. We try to apply the operator. If it matches, we increment by one. And then we return the selectivity being the number of match number the, divided by the number of buckets in the histogram. Here's the example again. You'll have to trust me on the math because we're not going to loop through all of these. There are 44 buckets here in this histogram that match my where clause. The number of overall buckets is 64. And so the selectivity will be 68%. 69%, I guess. What about it? Um, so here's what we have now. We have the sum of this uh, of the most common selectivity. So all of them together, we know what all of the most common values represent. We know how many, what's the per portion of null values from the statistics gathered by Postgres. We have the selectivity of uh, amongst our most common value, and we have the histogram selectivity. So now we are going to use all of that to get the selectivity of our specific clause. So again, we oop, initialize our selectivity to be all of my non-null uh, values that are not in my most common values. So because again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, histograms are 
only focusing on um, non-null, non-common values. It's the, it's the sorry, data distribution outside of those. So uh, we have this initial selectivity here, and we have we know that um, among that selectivity, we have our histogram selectivity, and so we we'll multiply them. And then we will add the most common selectivity because we initialized everything by completely ignoring the, the most common values. So we just add what we know also will match. So here's my example again. Uh, we uh, did before the most common selectivity together. Uh, we did the histogram selectivity together. We also have this null fraction here. Uh, that's the percentage of null values for that field that column and then the sum of the, co the common values frequency is roughly 70%. So we initialize it to be all the non-nulls, non-common values, and that gives us a very small 0.3%. And then uh, that's the, we merge it to the histogram selectivity. So amongst those non-nulls, non-common uh, values, there will be this many, like 0.2% that will match. And then we add uh, what we know from the most common uh, values, and that's uh, it ends up being 62%. Okay, so now we know how to uh, define, the, like how to compute the selectivity, you know, clause by clause. But your queries rarely only have one um, where. I mean, I guess, you know, sometimes for IDs and stuff, but often you'll have, you'll want more complex queries. Um, so to do that, and this is the, the um, file where you can look into, if you want to know more, for example, about subqueries and non-constant values and or, et cetera, you can look at, into the, this cute little file. Um, we start with a selectivity of one, and then we look through the clauses, we compute them one by one, the selectivity, and then we merge them by uh, multiplying them. So what does this mean? It means that here I'm running a query for the studies in phase one that are about diabetes. I have around 8% of my uh, of phase one rows in that table, and I have around 2% uh, that have diabetes in their title. And so when you merge them by multiplying those selectivities, you're saying, okay, around the, amongst the 8% that are in phase one, 2% will be about diabetes. That's what it means to multiply them. Is that true? Does it work? Yes, roughly. So if, if I'm look, it's comparing the rows uh, in my costs versus the rows that actually happen when I do my explain analyze, you know, has less than a 200 difference on a table that has, I think, 500,000 rows. That's, that's good enough. Except that doesn't always work like this. Um, so here's what happens. Um, you might have scalar operations that are on the same column. So here, my example is just column uh, smaller than eight and column bigger equal than five. And in that uh, situation, you can't just uh, compute the selectivity of this uh, clause and this clause and multiply them, because what you want is the overlap of those, those two clauses. We know that they're related. And so what we do is uh, compute the selectivity of my low bound and compute the selectivity of my high bound. So here in yellow, I have this and it's uh, 0 0.6 of my 10 rows. I, Chose a very simple example, I know. Um, and here it's in blue. We have 0 0.7, and what we want is the overlap. So we're going to add the selectivity of the high bound and low bound, so 0 0.7 plus 0 0.6, and uh, minus 1, which is my entire, um, if I was selecting everything. And so I end up with this 0 0.3, which is the overlap. Here's an example. Um, Let's say we ignore the math. It's here for uh, if you want to look at it. Uh, and again, if you are looking at your own statistics and you want to have fun with numbers, you can take the slides and do this again with your own statistics uh, that hopefully will help you. But here's where we end up. 
Uh, study type has a selectivity of 76%, and those two completion date is uh, bigger than December 31st, 2023, and smaller than 20 to January 1st, 2025. So what I want here in this query, I should have done that, said that first, sorry, is all of the studies uh, that happened in 2024 that are of a study type interventional. In this database, interventional means there was surgery, there were trying new medicine. There's also another type of ob observational for uh, if we're not doing anything, but we want to see the evolution of some diseases. Mm. Um, so we have all of this. We know that the null fraction is 0.03%. And then we combine them. So here's my uh, selectivity without the null and without the most common values times uh, the selectivity of the overlap of this. And uh, minus, yeah, and yeah, minus the one. Um, here it's actually the null fraction. I didn't mention it before because again, if you like look at my, whoops, sorry, overlap here, I wasn't actually dealing with null values, but the, there's also a few detail, more details. I guess I didn't go in too much details today. So here's what we end up with for the selectivity of this query. It's 0 0.0665, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so what do we do with that selectivity? Because cool stories, now we know about math. So um, here's the explain for this query. Again, same one. We're supposed to return in the estimation by the query planner 33,672 rows. In my uh, PG class, I have for that table an estimation of the number of rows that it, you should find there. Uh, if you multiply though that value, the rel tuples by the selectivity, you find this 33,672. Wee, that's where it comes from. Um, for explain and lie, so is that accurate? Is uh, combining those selectivities this way accurate? Again, yes, it works. Great. Um, if you want to know more about costs, uh, here's a file that you can look into. But here's the thing. It always it doesn't always work. Uh, Postgres does a lot of things for you, and it will, in general, help you get a really good query plan and execute your queries pretty fast. That's that's nice. However, here's here's the problem. Here I'm getting all the facilities in the great city of Lyon, that's where I live, um, in the country France. And we're estimated that there should be 297 of them. Okay, where does that select, the, where are those, those 297, well, sorry, 297 elements um, come from? Uh, well, it's because the number of uh, the, the selectivity for France is 6%, the selectivity for Lyon is 0.16%, and so we end up with 297 rows. However, that's because it's thinking out of the 6% rows that, of, out of the 0.16% cities that are Lyon, 6% will be in France, and that's not true. We know that 100% of the cities named Lyon are in France. It's not always true because there's a Paris, Texas for example, but let's ignore this, America's weird. I can say it because my husband's American, so I can say mean things about America. Uh, so here's the problem. When you do an explain analyze here, you go from 297, which is what it estimated, to actually it retrieves 5,605. That is a really big difference. The number, the expected rows, and the actual number of rows are completely different. The problem being that it could potentially choose the query plan. So here's what you can do. You can tell Postgres, well, actually, I know that those two columns are related. I know that there's a relationship between them. So I'm doing a create statistics dependency on country city from facilities, that's my table. I analyze that table. And here's the query plan after this, the actual number of rows is much closer than the reality. 
we. So uh, here's the types of multiple column statistics. Before we do that, and because we're very close to Halloween, you can't read this slide, it's way too small. But um, one thing is that, so I was working on this database, uh, again, that this um, database about medicine, which I don't really know much about. Um, and I wanted to find examples outside of this, you know, city and country example of moments where columns are related um, and the query plan gets bad. Except I didn't know this database. I I didn't know the I I didn't understand the schema of it. I was like, I don't know, things are happening, and that I don't know. The other problem that I had is I was hoping that they would let me have access to their PG stat statements, which they did not. So I didn't have access to their long long running queries either to have fun with them. So here's what I did: I ran this query on my local one, not not on theirs that they you know give you access to. Uh, this went for an entire day, so I don't recommend it doing on your production database or, you know, ever. Uh, but what I did was uh, get all of my <laughs> statistics um, that have most common values, like big, like more than a few, like a bunch of rows. And I tried combining them and comparing the actual rows returned versus the selectivity uh, that uh, was computed. And I was just matching most common values against each other and getting the ones that are wrong. Uh, yeah, again, it's, it's a fun query. You, if you want to read it, you can. Uh, uh, when I share the slides, don't run it. It's just a bad idea. Also, it gives a bunch of like interesting cases, but also a lot of false positives. So don't think, oh, I'm going to actually run this query and create the statistics on whatever it gives me. No. But here's the thing. So we have create statistics, you know, helps with uh, cases where the columns have a relationship. You can manually force Postgres to know about them. And there are three types that you can create. The functional dependency, the number of distinct count uh, with, you know, your two or three columns or four columns, whatever, and the multivariate most common value lists. Um, so dependency, that's what we just, you know, showed the example for. Uh, the values of also, there's another case where it's interesting is if uh, your columns are related by like uh, one uh, column A equal column B plus 10 or 15 or whatever, like if there's a math correlation between them, that's you can also use dependencies. Um, and then you have the end distinct count. So remember Postgres was gathering distinct uh, values, the number of distinct values for your uh, your column. Here, it's doing the same thing, but for multiple, like just the number of combinations that you could have. It's especially interesting for group buys because during group buys, it's the, it's, it's more, I think it's maybe the most common issue with statistics is it will really get it wrong uh, in the estimation of groups that you could end up with. So here's the example that I took. It's a category and title from the baseline measurements. Why are they related? Uh, it's because my query told me so. Uh, but um, this uh, the the category is going to be like all of these things, like sex, race, etc. And then uh, the title being the more specific group, like subgroup. Um, so I created um, the. Um, uh, well, sorry. I got disturbed. Um, <laughs> you have uh, this query that I'm running to get the top 10 groups and their representation amongst clinical studies. Uh, before create statistics, I this query took 800 and, 900 milliseconds, afterwards 300 milliseconds. Um, here are the explained plans, but we're going to before and after, but we're going to just focus on the parts that are actual, actually different. So here um, you have the group, The it's estimated that uh, it should be doing group buys on 400 and, like 460,000 rows. Uh, here 
it's 11,000 after the great statistics. And so the strategy that it's going to use to do this group by is different. On one side, you're going a group aggregate where you're then sorting. On the other side, because it's much smaller, it's able to sort first and then uh, do a hash aggregate. A hash aggregate um, is a little more expensive when it comes to memory, uh, but much faster. But the group aggregate, you'll have to do it if you, if you have a lot of data to group by, it will choose a group aggregate and that will be slower. So that's one case where the query plan gets wrong, Postgres picks the wrong one, and actually like a query being three times faster, that's, that's a pretty big difference. So now the multivariate um, most common values list. Uh, so one difference that you have between dependency and uh, and this most common values list is that with most common values list, as, as we've seen before, you can apply different uh, operators than equal. So uh, one of the scalar ones, smaller equal, et cetera. Um, so that's one reason why you would choose most common values list over dependencies. So here I'm doing create statistics on the organ system and adverse event term from my reported events. Reported events is during your clinical studies, anything that goes wrong goes in that table. It's not a, not a fun one. But here's why they're related. Like the organ system, it can be what well, gastro, sorry, it's hard to pronounce. Belly problems. <laughs> brain problems, mm -hmm. et cetera. And then the terms can be nausea, headache, et cetera. So yes, like uh, nausea would be more belly problem than nervous system problem. So yes, they, they are related, uh, those two. So I'm creating, uh, so here's my, um, my query. I want to um, get um, the frequency threshold being uh, kind of the, percentage of people who got um, affected by this on the study. So I'm getting the worst studies in terms of patients that uh, reported hypoxia, so low level of oxygen in the blood. Fun one. Uh, before I created uh, statistics, like in, in that case, it's both of them are index scans, so you know, it didn't change the query plan. What's interesting is that, yes, uh, I, I used to estimate that would, there would be 1,200 rows when they were actually 17,000 after it's accurate. You should know that there are limitations to that. Um, because right now histograms aren't supported in uh, extended statistics. So they are only kind of accurate for most common uh, values. And if the rest of your data set is evenly distributed, because if it's not in the most common values for your combination of rows, it will go back to the uh, default algorithm and so estimate the selectivity, you know, by thinking that it's evenly distributed and merging them. So here's my problem. Uh, instead of hypoxia, I'm looking at asthma. Uh, and suddenly, even though I did create my, um, my, 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 I did do my create statistics, I go back to having a huge difference of estimation of 56 versus 11, 12,000. So what can you do to, for that? You can configure some things in Postgres to you know, improve on your statistics. So by default, the, you have this default statistics target that is 100 and you can you know, make it go from one to a thousand. This is the number of elements that we want to compute. So your most common values would be probably a hundred, sometimes smaller if you have an enum or not a lot of different values in your table. Um, and so you, you can vary that. And this default statistics target would be for your entire database. You can also tell it, well, actually, I don't need to retrieve like 10,000 for my entire database. I just need to go a little higher for this, uh, this column. Um, just a little note, I guess, so by default, it's 100 and it works pretty well. If you um, have more, uh, if, you know, if, if you have a really Big database with really big tables, maybe going higher, so like around 5,000 could help you. In data warehousing, that could be interesting, is what I mean. 
Um, so here I set it to a thousand instead of a hundred. That's ten times more. Oof, only five. Okay. Um, I'm not going to have time to, for a lot of things. Sorry. So whatever. Basically, here I'm increasing it. Yay! I get the the the, the good values again. Wee! But here's the thing, I go into an even less common one and I get back into that problem because, you know, there's only so much you can do if your data, if your data isn't evenly distributed outside of those, you know, common values one, you will always have that problem. Here's the thing, maybe you don't care. Maybe those are small queries and, you know, because it's not as common, you will hit them less and you will care less about whether the query plan is optimal or not. Uh, here's all the things you can configure. This. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to get to a part that is personally important to me, but um, I, I so I want to talk about it real quickly. So it's how Postgres gathers statistics. Uh, what it does is gather a sample of rows because it's not you know computing statistics on your 500 million rows in your table or whatever the number is and then compute statistics on those sample rows uh, and then update the table. To get that, uh, it's going to first figure out how many rows it needs to get. Uh, the default being this 100 is uh, the target of uh, values. And the 300 here is a constant based on a paper named random sampling for histogram construction. How much is enough? If you want to know more, you can read this file. Um, so, uh, to get it, it's, it's a reservoir algorithm, so it's going to go, go through, uh, fill a list of whatever many rows we want, and then each new row has uh, like a probability to be selected, and if it's selected, it gets uh, replaced randomly in the existing list. Cool. Okay. Um, so, once we have our sample rows, we are going to uh, get statistics on each column. We can't get all of the statistics um, all the time. So here's an example. If, you, if you, there is no equal operators, which is the case for JSON, and also for uh, some geometry types like points, and I, yeah, I, yeah, points, I, I'm pretty sure. Um, then if you can only do equal, which is the case for uh, some geometry types, again, like lines and also ACL item, which is a type used for privileges in Postgres. We're going to compute only the most common values. And if you can do whatever you want on, the, on your type, we're going to also get the histogram and the correlation. So one thing that I want to talk about real quickly is that to compute the most common values, this is a brute force algorithm. So we're going to initialize a track list of all the previously seen values and their counter. And the size of that list is 100, if you have you know, 100 as the target. And then we're going to look through uh, our sample rows and fill that track list uh, to be like, if, you know, if, I haven't, I have, if I haven't seen the value before, I insert it right here after the last element that has more than one. And that's because our rows are ordered by physical place, space in the table. So, you know, older values that we've only seen once, we assume that we won't see it again. Um, and so, you know, here my six disappeared, yep, and that's it. Uh, if we've seen it, we increment the counter and we bump it up the list as needed. Uh, for the histogram, it's roughly the same thing, except we need to have a track list of all values in the sample rows. So that track list is going to be much bigger, which is a problem for when you have multi-column um, statistics, which I think is why it's, uh, histograms aren't supported yet, because you have a pretty big track list. So the values that are, you know, you, you get everything in the number of times you've seen them, the most, you know, frequently the that are like significantly more common than others are in the most common values, uh, and the leftovers are uh, split into buckets. So here's an, an example. I have, you know, this histogram, let's say it's, you know, this that I've seen, uh, and uh, in the end, you know, I have, I, I, estimate, I say, well, those four first ones are the most common values, and the rest, I want to divide them in evenly spread buckets, 
the number of buckets being uh, the number of items left. So I add you know all the frequencies here divided by um, by the number of distinct minus the most common values. So I end up with the my bucket size should be around three. So I will end up with the histogram starting with two, 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 et cetera, et cetera, um, because I, this one is a little more common. And then between nine and 11, I have one bucket, then 13, et cetera. Not going to go into uh, how the number of distincts is computed, uh, but again, look at the slides. It's pretty interesting. It's just, I don't have time. And I wanna say a little final word, <laughs> conclusion to, to let you go to lunch. Uh, with a summary of what we've learned today. So Postgres statistics, Postgres gathers statistics on single column all, all by himself, like a big boy. Girl, eh. um, during analyze. Uh, the query optimizer uses the statistics to choose a query plan and the select with while you, when using with using sorry, selectivity um, allowing us to you know know how many rows are going to return and the size of the data. Postgres merges by default the selectivities, assuming that the columns aren't related at all, which is not always true. Histogram and most common values are brute forced. So your analyze, if you go to 10,000, which is something I haven't said before, your analyze will be slower. And so will your query optimizer because it will have to loop through more values. And that is like a balance to find between, yeah, my analyze is slower. And so it is my query planner, but actually my query itself is faster. So that's something to test out, right? Like there's less, I think that there is less, less risk in doing create statistics than create index, for example, where you would actually impact your rights a lot. Um, so anyway, a higher value might lead to a better plan if you're changing the, 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 the targets. Uh, and but you should know that multivariate statistics also have their own limitation when your data isn't evenly distributed. If you have questions, I'm sorry we don't have time. However, I'm here all day. You can ask as many questions I, as you want. Um, this, this QR code is for if you want to, I think it's a review of the talk. I don't know, I was told to put that QR code in here. Um, I forgot. Uh, and yeah, that's it.